years of experience in carrier and carrier task networking, telecommunications, and satellite system design, development, deployment, sales, and marketing. Tom began his career working on the space shuttle launch processing system. He held positions as a design engineer, systems engineer, project director, and most recently as president of a satellite communications company since 2002. Specializing in wireless technology, <coughs> Tom has supported dozens of networks throughout the world and is now focused on electromagnetic radiation mitigation as a principal engineer with Green and Health Homes. Tom holds an electrical engineering degree. Uh, and he has also been the our great IT support this morning. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> And we haven't really done that great of a job. Of doing this, but, uh, I used to be proud of my background, uh, but at this point I'm, I'm almost ashamed of it. And it's really uh, more like thousands of wireless networks that I've deployed all over the world. And uh, so to everyone in this room that uh, is sensitive and, uh, and all of those uh, watching virtually, I'd like to apologize to you for that. And so I'm going to try and make things right in the world. And, and, and by doing that, and, and what I mean by that is that I want to try and fix many of the problems that we know are fixable out there. And, and that's really the best news I can give you today is that there is a lot of things that we can do as, as engineers um, to solve these problems. Um, and so that is exactly what we're specializing on. And, and I encourage each of you to uh, reach out to us. Um, that is why we're here, one of the reasons why we're here. So. Having said that, I guess I'd like to ask if there's anybody here that's with the utility, with, with the FCC, if there's with a regulatory agency, or um, is not of what I believe is like-minded people that are here today. They already left. They're not going to tell you. They already left. Okay, well, my message was in large part to them. Um, but, um, so anyway, um, as an engineer, I have always been fascinated with technology. I've always been interested in how things work. I've always interested, been interested in how to fix things so that when there's problems, that turns me on. I'm, I'm on it. And so that's what I'm really trying to do with the smart meters and, and the smart grid technology. I'm going to talk mostly about smart meters, but I'm going to give you a little bit of context, a little bit of background about the smart grid and kind of drill down from the top. So um, with that, um, I really set out and asked, why is this little tiny meter such a big problem? Um, it really doesn't look like it would do all that much, um, but as it turns out, it's a, it, it really is a smart device and has a lot of communication capability, which is really part of the root of the problem. It's a very connected device. It has computers in it, multiple computers, in fact, and it's a programmable device. So I'll show you why that's a big deal as, as we go through this thing. So we're going to start, start at the top, talk about the smart grid, move into smart meters. I'm not going to get into too much detail on the grid. This is kind of a detailed presentation. I'm going to try and keep it real. And uh, if it's too much, you can raise your hand, and then I'll try and move on. So we'll talk about uh, exposure levels, how we as building biologists are concerned about these exposure levels. And we have standards that we apply to the work that we do. And, and as you'll see, they're much, much lower than the FCC limits. And, uh, and we make people better. So we can reduce these exposures, and we have people thank us for that. And we do make their lives a little bit better. Um, so I'll talk about how we do that in a way of uh, mitigation or remediation. And then I want to address some of the issues that really stem from the technical capabilities of this technology as a whole, and then kind of summarize it um, as best I can. So really, here's a picture of the smart grid. It, uh, it, it really is consists of these four basic building blocks from the power generation on, on the left-hand side of the slide, um, to the transmission network, to the local distribution network, and then to the, to the home. And one of the big problems that we have is we don't have enough power generation during peak time to supply the power to all of the homes and businesses out there. So that's the fundamental problem that the smart grid is supposed to be addressing. And I know that there are many other um, factors involved in, in why we're spending all this money, but it really does come down to that. And to do that, we knew we, we needed to put some device on the home that would give us control over the load in that home. We actually already do this in businesses. Um, they already have a lot of these same mechanisms. And so a lot of the things that we see in the smart grid today really came from years ago. Um, we talked about smart meters, but really there's a procession of, of technology going back into the 90s and even before. Um, and of course, you know, meters themselves go back into the, to the, uh, to the 19th century, and I'll show that to you. So now we have this intelligent device on the side of the house. 
It doesn't really do anything other than give me capability. It doesn't in and of itself do anything. And, and as uh, Jan said, it really does rely on another network. I've got to be able to control the load inside the home. It does give me visibility as to my power consumption. I think that's a great thing. If you see when you turn on a light switch that you just spent some more money, you'll probably not turn that light switch on or at least turn it off when you're done. I think that's a great, great thing that we can do for, for all of us. So, what they've done to, to make this happen, now we've got this meter on the side of the house, is we've implemented a communications network. Um, and it connects all aspects of this, these four components. And it's automated what's going on in the network. So when we have problems in one place in the network, we can autonomously fix the problem, route around it, and avoid uh, outages, which has been cost billions of dollars to the, to the country. Power is an essential uh, element, just like water in many ways. Um, these communication channels are the problem. Uh, unfortunately, they had choices that, that had to be made as to how they designed this thing, and they chose wireless. And it's all economic driven and control. For the most part, it's economic and control. Um, and I'll, but I'll talk about that there are other alternatives, and you know, really we could have spent this money in much better ways. And if this had been done out in the light of day, and we've got lots of other people, engineers, and, and other minds involved, we could have really made some better decisions, and we're spending billions of dollars. It's going to have to be fixed. Uh, eventually, it's going to have to be fixed. Um, but there's some good news here, and I'll get to that. This is a model. This is not the way all utility companies are, that are, are put together, but they all have, in essence, this infrastructure of, of power, transmission, distribution, and home. But they also have a marketing element. They have to go out and buy power. They sell the power that they generate. So there's a whole um, um, wholesale and a retail market that's going on out there. They're really interested in everything that's going on in this network. They want to be able to predict what usage is going to occur and when, because they can buy cheaper if they can. If they can anticipate demand, they can they can hedge their bets, so to speak. The operation folks, they just want to keep the thing working. And so they've got a vested interest in this whole thing. The service providers are really the customer side of things. They're the ones that are going to take the heat when the power goes out. Um, operation side, the, all these all these groups, of course, communicate with each other, and that's why you see all these blue lines. These are all communication links to make this thing work smoother and faster in all time as well. This graphic represents the fundamental problem, where we're, we're showing our kilowatt uh, usage on the vertical axis, the horizontal axis in the 24-hour period, and we show that the yellow path there is the peak demand. Most of the time, we've got plenty of power, but at, between 2:30 and 7:30, according to this chart. That's when demand goes up, and, and the blue line is when we don't do anything about it. And that is the uh, reason why we do have brownouts and outages and things break. Um, if we introduce something just like a, a, a thermostat, a smart thermostat, we can start to reduce the, that peak consumption. And what we're at, in essence doing is we're turning devices off, the air conditioner in this case, or the heater, and we're trying to time shift them. We want to move it out into non-peak times of the day. So it seemed like such a good idea. Now let's go ahead and throw some money at the problem. Um, so now we are going to make it less expensive if you kind of participate in these in these programs to avoid, to avoid to help us manage the peak load. And that's what the orange line represents. It shows that this really does work as a mechanism that does um, help us in implementing a more secure network or grid. I'm not going to get into this drawing. This is a more detailed model of of what we're, we're talking about here. This is the National Institute of Standards model. Um, the, the parts in red are really what I'm talking about. This is a huge world um, with billions of dollars being pumped into it. Um, you can imagine that everybody wants to get a piece of that. So I'm going to concentrate on the network, or the neighborhood area network, which is uh, in the middle there, the NAN, and the home area network, which is on the right. But all these lines represent protocols, and both communication, the messages that are going back and forth, the mechanisms that make this whole thing work. This is a kind of an interesting drawing. Um, it really shows that the smart grid is more or less the who's who of American technology. Um, at every layer of the, of the components that make up the smart grid, there are players and there are participants, and they're all competing with each other. If you look at this, and, and maybe you can at, at a later, later time, you'll realize why there's so much money in this thing. These, this, this many players move industries. They make it happen. So when, when they want to see uh, development dollars brought into this or products, they, they have the development teams and they are gearing up in a huge, huge way 
and really we're just getting started. So, um, that's really what the red lines here are just kind of pointing you out, that it really is divided up into the different functional blocks of, of the, 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 the engine that makes up the smart grid. And we're going to talk mostly about the itrons of the world, the, the, uh, the, the elsters, and the others that make up the smart grid. So I'm going to start drilling down a little bit farther. Um, over on the right-hand side of the home area networks, and you can see the little round circle, which is the, the smart meter itself. And you'll see that the smart meters actually talk to each other, and you can see that by the, the gold dash lines. They also talk back to the utility company through a number of different ways. Uh, one of the ways that we see most often is, is a neighborhood area network. Of course, this is all wireless, but you do see meters that will talk. Um, they'll bypass the, the neighborhood area network, and they'll use cellular technology for the most part. Whether it's 2G, 3G, or even 4G, there's players out there that are implementing a wholesale 4G network, and they are and they're, and they're getting uh, um, wireless providers to buy into this, and so they're trying to change the cost model and shift it over so they can get a bigger piece of this model, of this, this, this play, um, and, and take it away from the vendors that make the network uh, uh, network components. Um, so there's a lot of technologies in here. There's some wireline uh, as you get farther into the network, um, but for the most part, this is a wireline play all the way. So if you're looking now at the neighborhood area network, um, I've said that the meters themselves really do form a mesh network. They talk to each other continuously. Um, there, there's a beacon signal that the meters send out. This is the thing that we can actually read with our meters. Um, we see it most typically uh, sending out a, it's a burst of about 170 bytes of data. And, uh, and you'll see it maybe every 30 seconds. Um, the reads themselves are hard to catch. Um, the actual reading of the data itself is hard to catch. But the thing is, is sending out this beacon, this incessant beacon signal, and that is really what is, is really driving people nuts. I mean, if they read the meter once a day, that's one thing. But when you do it every 30 seconds, and, and it's a programmable thing, they can make this, they can make it seven seconds, they can make it five minutes if they want, wanted to. So you know, everything you see here is programmable. These are decisions being made by the utility that best suit their needs without regard to the general public. And I think that there's, a, there's an opportunity there for us to guide them in the direction they need to go. So this is, in essence, how it works. The homes broadcast together, and it works its way through the neighborhood, and it finally finds one unfortunate soul that has a meter on the side of their house that's collecting the data from all the other meters in the neighborhood. Or there might be a device out on the pole which is doing that, and that's what you see here. And then the pole device is actually using perhaps a cellular link or a number of different technologies to send this data back to the utility. And it'll probably go through a couple of hops to, to get there. But that's in essence of how it works. Now going down into the home area network, this is kind of a pretty picture of a feel-good picture of a home area network where all the all the devices in the home are connected back through the smart meter. Our new electric car plugs into it, our solar panels. Um, we've got smart uh, appliances throughout the home, uh, many, many smart appliances. Um, but what they don't really talk about is that this is a nightmare scenario. So when you look at a, at a, at a model like this, and this happens to be GE, and I'm sorry to pick on GE here, but they really did me a favor by putting together a graphic that says 12 <laughs> transmitters all talking together. This is yet another mesh network. And, and I'll give them credit, those are slightly lower power devices than the, than the smart meter, the other link, the network at, uh, area, neighborhood area network link. But when you put this many transmitters in a home, they're going to have to talk to each other to maintain the integrity of the network. But this is where it really falls apart. And this is the fundamental mechanism that makes the smart meter work. If it doesn't have a home area network, it can't really reduce power, can't shed power. And, and of course, there's going to be incentives, you as a homeowner, can buy into this and say, yes, I want to participate. You can turn off my refrigerator or my stove or my hot water heater when it's convenient for you. Um, the problem I have is that there's no, tra there's no transparency here. You may buy a, a smart appliance and not even know there's a transmitter in there. And that, this is what we find a lot because this stuff is invisible. People don't even know they have transmitters that are just broadcasting. I'm going to answer questions at the end. Oh, okay. Dr. Bill Deagle said that they can put any any kind of chip in that smart meter for any purpose, and we wouldn't know. We would not know because it is programmable. These are posted stock size pieces of. So they can do other things. There's there's no transparency. 
Sure. And that's a huge market. I mean, there's, there's billions of dollars going into just this network. Um, and, and as you'll see, it's this is bad enough, but we all have Wi-Fi networks as well. There are many, many vendors vying for the the, the, uh, the living room. They want to interconnect everything. And if it's not wireless technology, it's power line communication, which also has its, its issues. Wiring a house is hard, but that's really what we have to do. Um, and that would, that would go a long way to solving the problem. And we do wire houses. Um, so now I'm going to drill. I'm going to shift gears now. That is just a snapshot of the smart grid. Now, there's so much more that we could talk about, and, and I will. I will come back to some aspects of it. But now I'm going to talk a little bit about meters themselves. We really are talking about a lot more than just the electric meters. There's, there's water meters. There's gas meters. There's other flow meters. And of course, they've been out there for, for many, many years. And they've been communicating in a, in a quiet way. Once a month, they get read, and so there was no tension. It wasn't that big of a deal. But as I show you, we've kind of we've progressed in, in the wrong way. Mostly what we're talking about, you can tell if you've got a smart meter on the side of your house just by looking at it. They're pretty iconic. The smart meter has an LCD display without exception. Um, and the old analog meters have the little dials without exception. Um, there is the possibility you could have an analog looking meter back in the early days. They can actually retrofit these things with wireless. So to know absolutely for sure you need to put a meter on it, but again, it's hard to catch. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more why it's hard to measure some of these things. Um, we've got single family dwellings. Can you imagine living in an apartment or a multifamily dwelling where you've got 10 or 20 of these meters on the side of your house and, and your bedroom is right there? I mean, that's, that's, that's a death sentence is what it is. And uh, that's got to change. Um, I talked about the fact that the, the industrial and commercial sector for years has been doing power load shedding and, and they've been using smart meters to do that. So there's a whole group of commercial meters that can look at power quality and other things that the, the residential meters don't do. Uh, but then of course we have the commercial meters. There's a whole lot of flavors of those as well. From a history perspective, we go back to 1851 where the first gas meter came about. In 1872, the first electric meter, um, first spinning meter back in 1889. This, this is old, old technology. It's been around and nothing really happened with it for years and years and years until the 80s. And like everything else, solid state electronics started coming into the, into the picture and we knew that microprocessors would eventually work their way in and that's, that's exactly what's happening. So you combine microprocessor technology and communication technology, you have what is called a smart device. So that's where we're at now. Um, up until through from 1990, really in the early 2000s through 2005 or so, uh, or really through 2009, we had the automated meter reading capability uh, that started proliferating many, many uh, municipalities around the country. And this was a device that uh, would once a month broadcast um, its capability. And a guy could drive down the street in his truck and start sending out messages that said, wake up, wake up, send me your data, send me your data. And he'll go along and they'll slowly send his data. He can drive, around, drive down the street about 30 miles an hour and make a sweep to an area. And he can, he can read about 10,000 meters a day doing that versus maybe 1,000 a day with a guy walking along with a wand where you come up with his optical device and actually stick it in the meter and read the data and log it in his little device and take it back to the office and download it in a day. But now we've got uh, meters that have two-way communications. You can read them anytime you want on demand. They're collecting data um, pretty much every 15 minutes. They'll be broadcasting it at different intervals than that. Um, this again is very programmable. Uh, they could broadcast it once a day. They could they they could change the amount of RF that's coming out of this device if they wanted to. And this is something that I think we should they should consider, and they can do this immediately. These are business practices. Um, and the essence of it is that meters have evolved from mechanical devices to electrical mechanical devices to all electronics. So these are all solid state um, components in these meters today, just like everything else. This is a pretty revealing slide. Uh, this is from the industry itself, and it's talking about the evolution of smart meters themselves. So as I said, the, the analog meters from 1872 up to around 2005, they're probably still making them. We're probably taking all these analog meters um, off our buildings and shipping them to some other part of the world, parts of the world to be reused uh, for a very low price. Um, so here comes the first generation of um, what we call smart meters, the automated meter reading systems. They're one-way systems. 
Um, but they would basically give the, the utility the capability of, uh, of understanding the load, so they know how much power this home uses, and they can do this for all homes in their network, and so they're getting smarter in, in, in usage now. Um, the, yeah, the tamper detections, theft of meters is, is, is a huge deal. You really just unplug a meter. There's not this little band around it on these little tiny uh, clip locks, but there's nothing that keeps you from just pulling it right out. out. And uh, in many parts of the world, uh, power theft is, is a huge issue, and it's, it's a lesser to a lesser degree it's an issue here. So they started putting features in these things that would notify them when someone went in and did something to their meter. Their, they're, they're kind of clandestine about how they go about doing that, and, but there are a number of ways to do it. Um, they could also do this last gap. If the power goes out, there's just enough juice in the, in, in the meter so I can send out a message and say, bye, <laughs> um, but, which is kind of neat. Um, but it, it, it automated the whole process of meeting, reading the meters themselves. So we're, we're moving along here. Then they went to an AMR plus technology. Um, they can, uh, they can now do what they call other commodity reads. Now that to me is a very scary thing because commodity, commoditization, means now we have something that is plain as dirt and people are going to want this information. And that's what this is. This is information. It's very, very valuable information because it's telling you a lot more about what's going on at home than just their power consumption. And they realize there's a huge market for the commoditization of this, of this data. And they, they're the ones that really just didn't have the technology to amass the kind of information that we would have a lot of value. Smart meters make it probably the most valuable data in the world right now. And so um, they are going to commoditize and sell this data. And, and this is in their own literature. And what I'm telling you is that they have the capability of doing this. What we need to know is what their plans are, what their intentions are. And I think each of us as homeowners have the right to know what they're going to do with the data they collect from our home. And unfortunately, it reveals a lot more than just usage data. So now we're evolving. Now we can read every hour. We can read the power every hour in the home. And we can send it out, or we can collect it and send it out maybe once a day. So, um, and we can actually do it on demand. So, and now we can look at hourly interval data. So we're really starting to focus in on what's going on in the home. So now comes AMI, and this is what we're, where we're at today. And we've got the home area network interface. They realize we've got to have connect devices in the home. Now we can look at power quality, which has an awful lot to do with the efficiency of the, of the distribution of the power. The power system is incredibly inefficient. I mean, the power plant itself is, is on average 33% efficient. And then you have losses all down the chain. So by the time you deliver power to an end user, you're down in the teens as far as efficiency goes. You could just, you could produce that power locally and, and and have much greater efficiency. And I think that that's something that we really need to consider. I can see why the utilities are probably not interested in that model, um, but they're going to try and get their hands on a little bit of it. Um, so now we've got a remote meter programming. Um, that means that what they've done is they've developed what's called service-oriented architecture. So the meters collectively are programmable. And all of the entities within the utility company can now write programs to access the meter and, the, and the, its capabilities to meet their needs. Um, and so exactly where that's going to go, um, I think I have a pretty good idea. I think it's a huge deal because it's going to generate a lot of RF. Because every time you go out and read the meter, you're generating the transmitters coming on and you're generating RF. And you know, I guess a comment to the industry is, do you consider this, this traffic when you talk about uh, duty cycle? And, and I think the answer is no. I think we've been deceived into thinking that duty cycle is just when we read use data. Well, that's a percentage of the overall traffic that's going through this meter. These uh, beacon signals are constantly hammering away. The operation people, they've got these things listed on their computer screen. They need to query it. If it's not acting right, they're going to say, wake up, talk to me, can I talk to it? All of these things are transmissions. And now we're going to add programmability to it. So all of these things add RF to the environment. Time-based rates. This is actually a good thing. Um, now we can use net metering. So if you have a, the capability of generating power in your house, the kind of utility will buy it back at a non-peak rate. And, uh, and, and you can then save money. You can theoretically make money on this whole thing. <laughs> and then the other thing that they've added is the integrated service switch. So now we never have to go to the property because we can turn, we can turn the power off or not. 
So the four meter reader is just about out of the game. Um, if you, uh, what's out there? Uh, these are the, the, the top six uh, smart meter players. Land of the year is the biggest one, 26% market share. This is a worldwide numbers. We see an awful lot of Micron uh, in the country. Um, and and this, this is the mix. So you can expect to see these guys when you go out there and, and start looking at meters. And I've been taking pictures of every smart meter I can see um, for months now. And, uh, and indeed, this is pretty representative for what you can see out there. Um, if, if you get one thing out of what I'm telling you today is that is to learn to use this FCC ID. Um, they are required, as with many, many devices that have transmitters in it, to put an ID on there. You can look this, use this ID to look up exactly what's going on inside of that meter. You know exactly what they're doing, the levels, how many transmitters are in there, the game, the antenna, and so forth. And so, it really does tell you the frequency it's operating on. It's a key piece of this whole thing. And so, um, and then it's basically this FCC ID is their right to operate this transmitter. Um, what they're supposed to put a lot of data on about their products, including user manual in this FCC database. And if you look at these things a lot, you see that they used to do that, but as time is going by, they're putting less and less information out there. And and I'd kind of like to know why. I mean, other than the obvious. And there's a lot of heat on these guys right now. Um, and this is very good information. And that, you know, really we do have a right to know how these things work and, and what they're doing. And so that is a great source of information. Um, if you have someone coming out to look at your smart meter, look up that FCC ID. Anybody can do this. You just search on it, you'll find that the database is quick and easy. And at least you're a little bit more knowledgeable about what's on the side of your house. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going into a block diagram of a smart meter. Just only point out this thing that has microprocessors, multiple microprocessors. It has power supplies. Um, it has the LCD display electronics. It has the, the electronics that allow them to, to, to do the disconnect. And then you see that you have both the, the home area network module and the network um, area network module. And what's good is that these modules are interchangeable, so they can make these smart meters play in a number of different operational scenarios. In fact, they can make it play with uh, a wireline solution if they want. And so if you look at the reference models that a smart meter design engineer uses, you'll see every reference model has wireline options in there. And so it's very, very modular. They can go out and retrofit all of these meters. And I think eventually this is what's going to have to happen with, with, with wireline solutions. So it's a smart device because it has mul multiple processors in it. And I'll talk about these power supplies later on. There's some issues with power supply. If you try and save money, we typically pay a price. And, and of course, we're seeing that. This is um, basically, um, I heard it said that you could have as many as three transmitters in a smart meter, and that's true. Um, we kind of start off with, with the what we see most of, which is a smart meter that has one transmitter in it. Um, it may be a cellular transmitter in it, it may be what we see most of, which is this 900 megahertz mesh network um, in it. But you could also have another transmitter in it for the home area network. And you can have these things operating at the same time. So when you go out and measure one of these things, you really need to take that into account. It really is the sum of these transmitters that really tell us what we're being exposed to. So the, and, and again, if you're this unlucky person that has this, uh, this third type of meter, you've got three transmitters in it. And it's collecting the data through the home area network from all of the other meters in your neighborhood up to about, up to about 1,000 to typically about 500 is what I'm reading. So a lot of traffic is coming back through this meter. And then it's being backhauled through a cellular link. So now you've got a cellular technology, you've got a wireless mesh technology in both the home area network and the neighborhood area network. And, and it's just important to know that up to two of them can transmit at the same time, the exposure is the sum of all. Um, this is a different way of looking at the exposure levels. Basically, you have the world of the FCC on the right, you have the world of building biology on the left. Um, these are the FCC um, maximum uh, permissible exposure levels for both the 2.4 gigahertz, which is the home area network frequency, and the three of the 915 megahertz, which is most commonly the wireless neighborhood uh, area network MEC technology. And different frequencies have, have different thresholds. And so this shows you what they are. The smart meters themselves come in below that, 
and this is this is uh, what you would expect, and this is what you hear all the time. They they um, they do not exceed the FCC maximum permissible exposure levels. Great. Um, as building biology the biologists, we know that these are not acceptable threshold levels. Ours are much many orders of magnitude. Less than that. So when we go into a home, this is what we look at. We we love to get people into the none category, where we've got our meters are just silent. That's a great sound. Um, but even slight is so much better than than what we see through the FCC. Mm -hmm. Even se severe is better than the FCC. Um, and but extreme, it's you know this is this is this is lethal stuff. So um, kind of already said that the uh, the, the, the total exposure is some of the trans. Um, this is a chart that probably many of you have seen. If you're reading at all, you'll run into this chart. This came from the California Council of Science and Technology. And it's showing the relative uh, power of cell phones <coughs> to smart meters and some other devices. And they're showing you the cell phones are off the scale relative to smart meters. Um, unfortunately, um, and so they suggest here that smart meters are two orders of magnitude less than a cell phone. And, but thanks to uh, Daniel Hirsch, um, he went in there and started scrutinizing their data, and he realized that they had some fundamental flaws in their data. They had mismatched units, and this is a unit uh, uh, nightmare. I mean, microwatts per centimeter squared, microwatts per meter squared, milliwatts per uh, uh, square meters. I mean, it's, if you don't, if you got to talk apples to apples, and, and they found that they broke that fundamental rule. Um, they also didn't properly consider duty cycle which I think is a false argument anyway, but even just doing this little bit, it shifts things completely uh, the opposite, which is to just point out that smart meters are, are two orders of magnitude higher than cell phones. So thank you, Dave, for doing that. And this is the kind of misinformation. This information was widely put out in the press. Um, they made a big deal out of it. And, you know, this is the, the kind of misinformation that, that's, that's funneling, and, and yet, they're accusing us of misinformation. So I'm going to pass this around. This is a very interesting document that I found from iTron. It's basically how do utilities deal with customer questions on RF meters. And it's really uh, enlightening um, to see what they're presenting as far as how to deal with people like us. And, and you'll see that there's a party line in here, and you'll see the same party line repeated in many different things that you can read. And so I'm just going to pass around. If anybody wants to copy this, I'll be happy to send it to you. It's, it's um, scary and, and it's reality. And, and I'm sure they believe it. Well, maybe they don't. But. Um, another, you know, what's the problem? Uh, you know, wireless doesn't stop at walls. It doesn't stop in neighborhood boundaries. Uh, this is a great graphic um, of secondhand radiation in Salt Lake City. You can barely see the building down underneath these clouds of RF that's filling the community. Well, this is happening all over the country. And, and it's this is the thing that's out of control. You know, we're talking about smart meters, but of course that's just one more layer of RF that we're being exposed to. It's a big layer, um, but it's, it's not all there is. And it's, it's been evolving. Any, anybody that's looked at this knows there's a, a very sharp curve of the increase in RF that we've been exposed to. And this illustrates a graphic point. I mean, if we could see RF as a blue haze, we would all run, and we'd realize there's no place to run to, I believe. Um, shifting gears again, talking about field measurements. This is looking down on top of a smart meter, and this is what it looks like. We, we, they have, uh, in this example, I have a dipole antenna in it. It has more or less a spherical um, radiation pattern. If you were to look at it from the side, it looked pretty much the same. Um, you know, one of the things they don't know when they manufacture meters, where the next guy that they need to talk to is gonna be. Um, they don't know that about the home area network. They don't know that about the neighborhood area network. So it pretty much has to be an omnidirectional signal. Um, so it doesn't have to be this way, uh, but this is how they design it because it makes their life a little bit easier. So from an RF engineering perspective, it's a lot easier to put a device in that you know is uniformly broadcasting anywhere. I can connect with anything uh, around me in any direction. So we use uh, meters to drive and measure this exposure. And, and this is the essence, and this is really simplified. But what's the FCC ID so I know what frequency it's broadcasting on? What's the power level? Where is the meter in the home? Hopefully it's on the side of your garage and not in your bedroom. Where are the location of the meters in the neighborhood? Because they're just as bad as the meter on the side of your house. 
Um, you know, we can fix our our own home, but then we're looking out our window. There's our neighbor's smart mirror. We may have it coming in from all four sides, three sides, but certainly we see lots of two side exposure. It's it's just a sad case. That's very hard to shield against. You have this stuff entering from every window in the house, and once it gets in your house, it's bouncing all around, and, and it's creating these hot spots. And uh, you know, if you are at one point in space, um, if you have uh, RF energy um, at that location, same frequency, same phase, it's the sum of that. So that's a hot spot. And I think Cindy Say pointed out that that far exceeds the FCC uh, threshold levels. And, and what, what do you do when you bring in the home area network? You know, you're going to have hot spots all over the house. So um, after we've done that, we're really concentrating on the sleeping areas. That's where we spend a third of our life. Um, at least make um, a place decent to sleep. We use things like sleep show canopies to make it acceptable. Um, but we determine if shielding can effectively solve the problem. In some cases it can, in some cases it can. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, mitigation. You know, we're talking awful lot about uh, opt out. It's so nice to see that we're making progress on this. Um, you know, they, they obviously they don't make it easy to opt down. They make it very expensive. Um, and, and even if you opt out, your neighbors don't opt out. So we've only put a band-aid on the problem. So, you know, unless the entire community uh, uh, brings their, 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 their wishes together, they're really not going to solve the problem. And that's what, that's what needs to happen. Neighborhood by neighborhood, community by community. And collectively, you can, you can reduce the exposure. Um, we've relocated meters, so we've had one that's right outside of the sleeping area. We'll move it down to the other side of the house. It costs three to five thousand dollars to do it, and again, you've got your neighbor. So uh, that doesn't always work. Um, certainly, distance is your friend when it comes to RF, as we know. It, uh, it attenuates quickly. Um, so, move beds, move furniture, sleep in a different room. These things work. Um, and as I said, shielding can be effective under certain circumstances, and you only know this if you go there and measure. And so we'll go in with shielding cloth and we'll cover windows and we'll basically see if we can mitigate it down to acceptable levels. And sometimes we can. It's just coming in all over. You have to basically create a Faraday cave of your home where you encase your home with shielding material. And then we could probably do it, but the cost is absolutely prohibitive. <coughs> um, really the ultimate solution uh, to the RF part is no RF, and, and, and this is true for both the neighborhood area network and the home area network. We have copper plant that's been in the ground for well over 100 years, and we're really letting it go to waste. We as a nation are letting it go to waste. This, this thing just stuns me that ATT, is they, they see the momentum. The telephone companies are they're losing the landlines just by the millions, and so they're going to let it just die. And yet it would serve us well. These meters have very through, low throughput requirements. They, 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 they're in text bytes. So they, they, it's not like you need a huge pipe, a broadband pipe, to achieve what you need to achieve. Uh, copper is perfect for that. I mean, obviously, fiber would be better. Uh, it has no emissions whatsoever. I would certainly like to have seen us put a lot of this money that we put into, into the smart grid and the smart meters into putting fiber optic links. Uh, we as a country would be so much better off. You know, one fiber optic strand could meet the needs for your TV for all time, for your telephone, for your internet, for your meters and appliances, and whatever you want to connect. So it is a really the best long-term solution. And there's many technologies out there that do exactly that. Telephone companies and, and others have been working on this stuff. I've personally worked on this stuff for, for years. So there are solutions that do this. It is expensive. And that's, that's part of the problem. And I guess the other point I would make is the utility company doesn't want to have to go to another player, either the cable company or the telephone company. That adds complication. When problems come up, they're going to have to pay for this, for one thing. And when a problem comes up, trying to coordinate multiple parties ends up just making it more complicated. There's always a lot of finger pointing. Where's the problem? Is it on your side, my side? But this is solvable. I mean, this is what engineers do every day. Is work with multiple entities. This is a complex world. No path from point A to point B in the communication network today goes to one place. So, shielding materials, we use a variety of materials. Uh, sometimes we'll put the materials in walls themselves. Uh, we'll use shielding material. They have great attenuation capabilities. 
Um, there's shielding kits that are coming on the market. I guess I would caution you on these shielding products. You can't just come, there is no cookie cutter solution to this. You can't just take a product off the shelf, send it to somebody that has a smart meter and say your, your problem is solved. Would it help? Maybe a little bit. But specifically, there's a product in there, and you'll, you'll see they put a ring around the smart meter, and they'll put a box, and they'll leave one side open so it can continue to do its business. Where, where it breaks down is you go inside, and there's a plate about this big that's shielding that smart meter. Well, RF just kind of laughs at that because it's kind of right around that, that, that plate. And it, unless you shield the entire wall, and it's like water trying to get in, you're not going to be effective in, in, in solving the problem. Shielding paint is something we're, we're seeing a lot of. We can put foil material on windows. Um, you can do this and still have a, 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 a pretty home. So we, we've done some extreme things um, where we, we really did have to <coughs> use all of these measures to solve the problem. So if somebody's really in love with their home, they may want, they may want to do that. So now I'm going to shift gears once again to um, smart meter issues. Well, number one issue is proliferation of RF. Number two is dirty power, and, and maybe biggest of all, privacy concerns. I mean, they're all huge issues. Um, we're obviously most concerned about RF. And, you know, when you realize that by 2020, there's going to be over a billion of these things out there, you realize the scale of the problem that we're dealing with. I mean, this is, this is massive deployment of technology um, that, that none of us really had any say so. Um, and, and it's just stunning. In the U.S. itself, 65 million meters by 2020. And that's half the homes in the country. And to make this work, they're gonna push for ubiquity. I mean, every home in the country will eventually have these, these meters. They're not making the old analog meters anymore. So what choice do they have? Um, they did this by design, right? I would imagine. Um, you know, when you look at this number of additional wireless devices, Based on my simple calculation, that's basically a 22% increase in cellular RF levels in our communities. I mean, that's a huge layer of, of, of RF. Um, it doesn't really have to be there. And, and that's not even the cell phones, it's not the WiMAX, it's not the Wi-Fi, it's not many, many, many other technologies. I mean, there's dozens and dozens of wireless technologies out there, services. that serve good causes. It's, it's, it's using them with discretion and realizing that people are getting sick, it's, that we've got to get past. So it gets worse, and as I've already said, there's, each meter could have multiple transmitters in it. Um, each home area network could have as many as 15 of these things in it. And then, uh, and then the smart meter, uh, the smart appliance market itself, they're pumping billions of dollars in it. They're gearing up. This is going to be the next phase. We're going to peak out on deployment of smart meters in 2012. And, and then it'll start being a slow ramp down as we push towards ubiquity over the following decades. Um, the smart appliance market is getting ready to ramp up in a big time way. And three to, to fifteen billion dollars going to grow from three billion to fifteen billion dollars by 2015. That's not that far away. So we're going to see a proliferation of these smart appliances coming into our home. And at the very least, give us the option of not having a wire a wireless device. At the very least, disclosure. Just like you would in a car, sticker on the side that says, this has a wireless transmitter in it. You may want to choose another one. And then there's all the transmitters that make up the rest of the grid, the, the neighborhood area network. So, you know, just layers and layers of RF that make it all work. I mean, after all, the wireless is the enabling technology for this whole smart grid. That's where it's all coming from. Without it, it gets more complicated. Now, wireline solutions are undesirable for reasons I've already, already mentioned. Dirty power. Um, this is the most well understood problem uh, from, from my perspective. Everybody knows that, that when we when solid state power supplies came into the market, they, 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 they went from linear power supplies that were big and bulky to these solid state power supplies. And they did this, they do what they do through using fast switching components inside the power supply. And they're just basically uh, sucking electricity or, or uh, current from the power lines. And they're doing it real fast. And, and that results in these little spikes that you see on, on, the, on the sine wave. So this should be a nice, perfect sine wave, which is what we like to see. Well, these excursions cause problems. So this is what's called a switch mode power supply. Um, it does provide the AC. It comes on the AC mains on one side and 
produce low level DC voltages, five volts, 12 volts, 3.3 volts, all common levels, and it provides power to the electronics within the meter itself, the computers themselves, they need to have power. Um, unfortunately, they distort uh, the, the power main, uh, and it's because of the switching regulator inside the power supply, and because of this inrush current, and it's what's causing this transient, and it causes noise and, and harmonic distortion. We're developing protocols to measure this. This is not an easy stuff to measure. It takes expensive equipment to do it. But the, the, the sad truth is that it's very fixable. This is where they cut costs by not pro putting proper filter, filtering on the front end of the power supply. So they save a few bucks, um, but they, they're probably uh, exceeding some standards for uh, excursions, and this is something I'm looking into. Um, but this is something we're, we're really focused on and we're gonna take a good hard look at. And really, nobody wants these, these uh, excursions. They're bad for the efficiency and the distribution of the power. Uh, they, they, these excursions travel through our AC line, they act as antennas, and they end up, they have the potential of creating uh, electric and magnetic fields. Um, so that's the connection um, that we as building biologists look at. Uh, there's another source of dirty power, and, and that is that the, the power line communication module. Uh, technology that they use. Um, in the U.S. it hasn't really taken off like Europe. Our, the way we distribute power is different here than it, uh, it does in Europe. We have many more transformers um, and they have to get through those transformers and so it's, it's a little bit more costly in this country and there are other technical issues. But it's coming. Companies like Echelon, are, they've had some big wins recently um, and so this is coming. And unfortunately, it uses the power lines to modulate communication information over uh, the, the power lines. And, and these cause excursions, which cause electric and magnetic fields. And that's what makes people sick. Um, so again, a wired solution would, would uh, mitigate this completely. So we don't like power line communications for that reason. I love it, technically, but it makes people sick. So that just makes it unacceptable. Um, you know, this whole subject of privacy is, is uh, really a stunning uh, revelation for me as I realize just what these things can do. And it really, it, it is like a stethoscope on the side of our house. They see so much information about what's going on inside there. And it really is, when you're home, what, what kind of devices you have in your home. Do you have an illegal server in your home? Again, I'm not saying they're going to use this in, uh, in, in, in ways that we would, would like, but it has the capability of doing that. And that's what I'm trying to communicate to you, is how this stuff works and what it can be done. And, and, and I certainly care a lot about you know, these issues. Um, and it's all part of trying to profile the usage, but it also profiles your behavior and, and in, in ways you may not want. And again, why isn't there an opt-out for this? I don't want information collected about me. So, I, do, I just don't see transparency in it. Maybe they're rich, but uh, this is not something that, that they typically talk about. Um, I have a real issue with the quantization of the use of data. I see strong evidence that they have every intention of doing it. It really is the last industry that's in a position to sell the data. All the other industries that are doing it, the, 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 the swipe card at the grocery store, and every time you make a purchase on your credit card, I mean, all this stuff is recorded. Well, now they're, now they're going to be able to look at a whole new set of things about us. And you will be advertised to, and your insurance rates could be based on that, uh, if you're doing illegal, illegal activities. Uh, the phone system for years has had something called Calia, which basically gave law enforcement the hooks to wiretap. It's a mechanism they can use to wiretap. Well, they at least had to get um, um, that's the word they're a, warrant. a warrant to do that. Or, uh, and, and, but with this, there is no discussion of that. So, um, so this is one of the issues that I have with it. Um, so peak load management is really uh, an important thing from their standpoint because that's what it takes to make this whole thing work end to end. Um, I talk about this non-intrusive appliance load monitoring. This is just one application that is being developed in the back end that's running. And it's uh, transparently just reading information uh, consumption about all your smart appliances. Um, and, and really can just look at, now that we're sampling power every 15 minutes, we can see an awful lot of stuff uh, about what's going on. So this is the kind of application that's coming. I believe in a big, big way this kind of stuff is coming. Um, and you know they're not going to, uh, as far as I can tell, they're not going to be very interested in having you opt out of the collection of this data. 
of blood to be on. This is uh, another graph that if you've been looking around for a while, you'll see this graph a lot. It's, it's, uh, this is actually collected in, in Italy, I believe. Uh, but this is showing what they can see. When you're looking every 15 minutes, you can see, well, here's my refrigerator turning on. And you know what? I can look at that, that uh, profile with this software and tell you what appliance it is. I'm going to create a database that tells me what you have in your phone, in your home. This is without a smart appliance. This is just because I can look very often now. So this is the kind of thing that they can see. So it's not just the consumption data, which is what they've gotten in the past. Now we can see all this other information. So I think it's kind of a, a kind of a scary scenario, uh, but maybe it can be used responsibly, responsibly to solve some more fundamental problems. You know, we don't want to have to spend the money that's going to take to build 90 more power plants, which is really what they're talking about. Um, I hope that, that that's the case. So, um, you know, in, some, in summary, uh, the proliferation of ours is going to be seen in ramp up. I mean, we all see the writing on the wall. This is. We are the ones that are turning this around. Organizations like us are the ones that, are, that may start to slow it, but we've got a long way to go. Um, and it's getting closer and closer to our homes. So now they're putting it on the side of our home and moving into our personal space. And I think most of us here take great exception to that. Um, I believe that home area networks, when you get that many transmitters in that small a space, are going to exceed SEC uh, maximum permission permissible exposure levels. I think a lot of what they're concerned about is interference amongst all these devices. It's all done in unlicensed bands. And uh, that means that there's going to be other players that are sharing the same spectrum. And it's an absolute free-for-all. If you travel around the world and look at the 2.4 gigahertz band, it's absolutely trashed out in many places. So to overcome that, they use things like, let's transmit maybe 10 times. Maybe the, maybe the message will get through. Maybe it won't. And sometimes it won't. So that's a concern. Um, the, the fact that they're programmable, I think it's, a, it's an industry. You see all those players, they love developing applications. Look at the smartphone market. I think it's something that is likely to go viral. And that means RF, increased RF. And, uh, and, and further compromise by privacy. Um, the fact that this data is likely to be sold in their own words, it's being commoditized. Um, and really, <laughs> We are, in essence, turning our homes and, and communities to, into giant microwave ovens. And, uh, for those of us that are not sensitive to it, um, it's just a matter of time. You know, I just, you know, my heart goes out um, to those that, that are sensitive to it. I mean, it's, it's just a fundamental wrong in our world. Um, so really, we are all uh, participants in, in the, the world's largest um, biological experiment, and it's all done without our consent. Questions? And why don't you come on out with your questions? The microphone's right here. First of all, in Vermont, the other utility that I have is going to use the Elster okay. meters. They're telling us it's it's um, once every 15 minutes and that there's nothing else going on. I said, Do you have a mesh network? And they said, Yes, but you know, this. So um, could they be telling you the truth, or are they? Are they I think that networks to, to work, they have to communicate with each other. Yeah, so they I don't think you'll find an exception to these beacons. If networks have to know that they're ready to transmit data, and they use the beacon signal to do that. So what's the right question? So I need to ask about the beacon signal. How do I, what question do I ask them to get the information? Tell me everything that's the device will transmit. Okay. And not just use data. Okay. Because right, they're saying the usage data is four times a day, and that's seven milliseconds or whatever, and so there's no more on the The other question is, I've asked this of a lot of people, and I don't know where to get the answer, but it's, it, if anyone costs it out, it takes a lot of power to run antennas for all this stuff, compared to if everything that could be done over fiber were done over fiber, what's the cost comparison for power consumption to make the networks work. This is supposed to be, you know, reducing carbon emissions. But if it's taking you all this power to have these antenna running instead of fiber optic, which takes very little power, how can you get a, a quantify the energy demand of just the system that's supposed to be saving energy? Well, if you, if they were uh, forthright with uh, specifications, we could look at the power supplies they're using. We know exactly how much power they're using. Um, you know, to, to be fair, these things are fairly economical. 
But yes, it is, it is, it is using power. And it may be that the wired solution we would use less. But that's an engineering question that I don't have to answer that real data. Did, are you, is there any way to update anybody asked the engineering question? I mean, should it, it seems to me that should have been asked before we decided which yes. technology we would use. Try to find the, the, the manual that you tell you that. And yeah. it's not, not easy to find. Thank you. So that's a great one. Please come up. I have one of your gigahertz meters that okay. measures, um, and I put it in front of some of these smart meters, mm -hmm. and I noticed that they come on, you said every 30 seconds, but I, I couldn't get a reading that was a burst, except maybe every three to five minutes. It's programmable, so it could be that they're, they're not putting out the feature signal quite long. Okay, so if I get a burst, that's when it's transmitting. It, it, it doesn't transmit necessarily just without any kind of reading. You, you normally get a reading when you have a, a, a transmission. Is so that correct? That's not, that's not correct. Uh, okay. You know, the beacon signal is basically network management. If you were to look at, if you were to do a log of the traffic coming out of the RF, coming out of the smart meter, you'd see that there's lots of short bursts. Then you see a high burst, and it's really good for technology, so this is kind of generic, I'm saying. Then you'll see a longer burst. Well, that's when you just transmit data. So that's hard to catch, though, and the only way you're going to catch that is using data along with the capability. You'll literally put your, your gigahertz meter up to some external device and continue to read you know, all day or 24 hours there. Then you'll be able to better characterize what's really coming out of that data. I have another question too. You said something about sending it through wires or sending it um, wire wire line, line. Yes. But you were saying that if we sent it through electrical wires, that wouldn't work because we create dirty electricity. That's right. So the only option we have to send it through wires is to get fiber into all the communities. Or the copper pairs that are going to own every phone in the country. Some copper pairs some, from the phone company. They, so, they, how about solar also cars? DSL is being used some places. What is it? DSL is being used. That's copper. That's using phone lines. DSL is using phone lines. It's a great solution. I mean, for homes that have broadband, we have huge penetration of broadband. They, they have modules that will actually interface with these things. So we and they can develop them quickly. Cop, cop, uh, um, we can use cable, Comcast. Like the meters are inherently capable of doing it if they were to choose to implement such a design event. But not the electrical ones. We do not want the electrical ones. Okay. It makes people sick. Okay. Please come up so I can. In light of the fact that um, the opt-outs uh, may, in light of the fact that opt-outs may or may have minimal benefits for the occupants, and I'd like you to speak to that that one issue. Would it be better in dealing with the utilities for us to ask for um, lower, uh, more infrequent messaging and lower signals, rather than pushing for opt-outs? I think that there are necessary discussions along those lines. You know, there are possibilities. They can architect these networks and it's a programmable device, so they can engineer it in any number of different ways. And they could reduce exposure just by changing the way, the operational way that you use the user itself. And so, you know, yes, they could. They could do things like put antennas uh, up over all over the place. You know, if they know that they, 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 they can do different antenna things, so it's more directional. I mean, we can, we can manipulate RF just like it's fluid. We can put it out in a very short path, we can put it out in a partial spray. So we have a lot of control over that RF. Um, so yes, there are ways that we can do this in, in ways that will not threaten our health as much. So obviously that's sort of a wider non-RF solution. Can you quickly speak to the advantages or the not, not complete advantages of all types? Well, you know, as I said, uh, you, you may opt out, um, but your neighbor doesn't. So, uh, you know, that at some time, at least the meter on the side of your house has a wall, typically, that shields it somewhat, but your neighbor's uh, meter is coming right in the window. Um, so it really is kind of a band-aid solution. And unless really everybody in a neighborhood does it, um, it you're not going to get a whole lot of bang for the buck. Um, are you are you in the traffic for greater just as much um, RF frequency? Are you getting 
the, the signal from one neighbor to the other going kind of through your it is it is point to point. I mean, if you're just happen to be in a, in a situation where meters, uh, a lot of meters are kind of going through your house to communicate with each other, you can have a, a perfect storm scenario. And, and, and anything is possible, all right. I mean, it, it reflects, it bounces around, and it does funny things, and it's invisible. So, and you don't typically engineer a, a wireless solution with that in mind. You're trying to make it work. The light. Say convince them, which is highly unlikely to program in a way where there was less RF. Couldn't they just change it at any time for their convenience and no one would know? Absolutely. So it's kind of pointless because they're going to do that anyway. They're just going to do exactly what they want. Yeah, there's a lot of things that are done that need to be better understood, and uh, they could do it with the click of a mouse. Yes. Um, it would be very helpful if. Perhaps Christine had done this already. If, if we could have um, access to your PowerPoint, I know that, that would be great. Thank you. I do yeah. this to help everyone and, here. Thank you. Thank you. This, is whole, thank you. this is a lot, and, and especially the graphics that are very helpful to have. The industry gave us the graphics. We so, <laughs> have uh, them to thank for that much. Right, but, but you're, you're delivering them to us. So. Trying to. Mary Beth. Uh, I wanted to bring up a couple of things. Um, first of all, I, I think it's it's interesting to contemplate in light of what they say they're, these, the purpose of these are um, to reduce energy usage, right, and to understand uh, peak load, right? Okay. First of all, along the lines of what you mentioned, Jan, uh, also to consider is the manufacturing cost, energy cost, uh, the incredible amounts, hundreds of millions, just in the United States alone. But this is a global thing. Oh, absolutely. So first there's that, and then there's the energy consumption of the data collected, the servers that have to process and store that data. It's enormous, over the top. Uh, I, I, sincere, I think you're sincerely looking at this from the point of view of, well, they really want to solve a problem. I don't, I'm not going to. I'm being an engineer. I'm not <laughs> And then uh, the other thing uh, is that um, even, uh, Jim, what, what's the ex uh, CIA, the head of the CIA's name? James Woolsey. James Woolsey points out, why would you do such a stupid thing with your with your uh, your security of your electrical grid for Pete's sake? It is so insane to make it all wireless. It is so vulnerable. Okay, so then uh, the other thing is. Um, the fact that they're doing this globally simultaneously, okay, that's another why, why, why. Another thing is, um, uh, oh, I think you put this up, uh, Orlean. There's been a recent um, study in, where was it, France or the UK, uh, that there is even the capacity from the use of these meters to determine what programs you are watching on television. I mean, come on. And then, okay, here's another thing. Uh, the peak load, uh, why can't you do that from the substation? Why do you have to have it from each one? I mean, that, that's- They do that. Uh, you'll see meters on the side of transport almost, and they'll basically check, make a checkpoint all the sum of the home, the meters on the home. So they, I think they do that already. They certainly have the capability, and they could do it on that basis. All right, then, why is it- yeah, Profiling gives them better, more accuracy in prediction of the power consumption, because not all homes are the same. They're down at that level. Your home may use less power than mine. Thank you, Mr. Smith, everybody can hear that. <laughs> well, anyway, I just think um, the whole thing has been uh, an absolute insane approach to a, 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 a problem that could be solved in a lot more 
uh, logical way. You can, you can solve problems a lot of different ways. Right. When you go back into a back room and do it, and then you come back out and say, give me money, this is what happens. Yeah, okay. and then there's the filtering. Did you, you talked a little bit about that, mm -hmm. but um, do you think it's, it's really uh, close to being um, solved for the SMPS um, problem, for instance? I think that some meters are probably better than others. Um, I would ask the industry to look at the quality of the meters they're using. And uh, the, the power supplies are YouTube. That's, yeah. that's my call, is to don't use cheap power supplies. Oh, uh, what do you think about um, absorbers rather than shielding materials uh, to eliminate the bounce around and propagate problem? And do you recommend people doing their own shielding or not? Uh, I really don't recommend people do their shielding. I think it's, uh, this is a... Uh, you know, there's not a lot of expertise in this space. I, I think absorbing materials may have a role in it, but yeah, this is what we're having to figure out. And uh, you know, I think it has its place, and you have to be real careful. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. If if the uh, let's say I opted out for um, that I didn't want them to do that at my house, but my neighbor uses Wi-Fi, how how far away would my house be? not to pick up these signals from other people who are using um, um, their meters who haven't opt out, as well as the Wi-Fi signal? How far? That's a great question. Um, and I don't have an absolute answer because there are reflections uh, and, and other ways that it can propagate. You know, I, I'd hesitate to give you a number, but, uh, you know, 100 feet from start to make me feel a little bit better. Oh, Tom, uh, I would just ask that in the proceedings of California Utility mm -hmm. um, Commission, and some meters travel 1,200 feet. The ones that in Northern California, because of the hilly and mountainous terrain, go over a mile. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, some meters will transmit, uh, they'll have a 1,200 foot broadcast, they call it, and then they'll come along every once in a while have a 2,500 or 2,400 foot broadcast. There's a whole lot of flavors of these things, and so it, that's why it's so hard to answer a question like that across the board. So I, I guess that I will close this by saying that the, the, the Institute, um, IBE, this is what we do, and, and we have um, people all over the country that have the tools and the skills to assess these problems and fix them. And, and you know, I, you're basically, we only can only do what we do through you, and together we can we can make life better for those that are suffering, and so um, that's why I'm so such a proponent of the of the IBE. We really this great work they're doing. And I don't know of any other organization that combines this holistic approach to our living space. You know, it's much more than just RF. It's all the electromagnetic phenomena, indoor air quality, the materials you use in your house, in your house itself. It's it's really so much more to a quality uh, life. And so that's what we do when we go into a home. We try and look at everything. So thank you very much.